Dr. Mandelbaum's keynote address set the context for our next panel. And our next panel couldn't be more timely as we look at the spread of terrorism around the world and we look specifically in the Middle East and what is occurring in Iraq and Syria, today's panelists will give their expert view on the strategy and strategic vision that we need going forward to combat this threat. Now, it's even more timely because a mere two weeks ago, uh, an offensive, an attack on the key city of Mosul in northern Iraq is ongoing, and as Iraqi forces have entered on the outskirts, uh, we'll have a chance to ask our panelists how that relates to this overall strategy and the way going forward. Now this session will explore the difficulties of exercising strategic leadership in an ambiguous geopolitical environment. The panel will look at this nature of disruptive nature of the jihadist threat and they'll postulate some ways strategic ways we should combat. Persuading key allies to adopt a common strategic vision and a strategy to implement remains a key and problematic topic. And during the course of this panel, or as part of your questions to the panelists, let's explore the implications of global jihadism on future conflicts. Now, I'm very privileged to introduce three great panelists. We'll start with our first panelist today, Dr. David Kilcullen. He is a Senior Future of War Fellow at New America Foundation and Founder and Chairman of uh, Caesaris Global Solution. Before joining private industry, he served 25 years as an Army officer, diplomat, and policy advisor for the Australian and United States government. In command, uh, he has, during his time, uh, been involved in operational missions, including peacekeeping, counterinsurgency, and foreign internal defense across the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and Europe. Uh, in the United States, he served as the chief strategist in the State Department's Counterterrorism Bureau and served in Iraq as Senior Counterinsurgency Advisor to General David Petraeus before becoming the Special Advisor for Counterinsurgency to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. He is also a best-selling author. Please welcome Dr. David Kilcullen. So I have 10 minutes to offend enough of you guys that we can get into a decent conversation when we get to the panel, right? <laughs> so I'm going to move pretty fast. And what I want to do is talk about how do we think about the Islamic State as an entity? And what does that tell us about what the strategy should look like? Um, why does that matter? Um, Klauswitz said that the first duty of the soldier and the statesman is rightly to understand the nature of the conflict in which they're engaged neither mistaking it for, nor trying to turn it into something that it's not. And if you look back at the last 15 years or so, I think we can say that we haven't done particularly well at that, um, that fundamental task of understanding the nature of the threat uh, and addressing a strategy to the reality of the threat that we're dealing with. You can also see, when you look at the discussion of Islamic State, just in the language that we use, the degree of confusion that there is about what is the problem that we're dealing with. Some people, as I do, call this the Islamic State. Some people use the term Daesh, which is simply the um, uh, Arabic initials of Dawla al-Islamiyya al-Iraq uh, uh, which is basically just the Arabic version of ISIS. Uh, some people use the term ISIS. Other people, mostly in the White House, call it ISIL. Um, and the fact that we have all these different terminologies about the entity is paralleled by the fact that we can't agree on what is the problem. Is it violent 
extremist organizations? Is it radical Islamic terrorism? Is it jihad? Is it a problem of poverty and disillusionment in the developing world? Is it an ideological problem? Is it fundamentally religious? All these issues get discussed and yet we rarely move beyond uh, sort of entrenched policy positions to think about what are we really dealing with. I want to start by laying that out and what I want to do is argue that ISIS is not one thing. It's actually three layers and each of those layers has different entities in it. And if we want to understand the nature of the entity in order to create a strategy, we have to start by understanding those layers. So the top level of the Islamic State structure is something that I'm going to call the Caliphate. And I don't mean by that to um, dignify Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's claim of the Caliphate and legitimize that, but that's the term I'm going to use to describe the state-like entity that exists in Iraq and in Syria that is, if you like, the central pseudo-state uh, of ISIS. If we go back to 1933 and the Montevideo Convention on the Rights and Duties of the State, which is one of several sources in international law that allows us to define what a state is, uh, that convention, to which the US is a signatory, says that a state has a number of characteristics. Um, it has a territory that it controls. That territory has to have some kind of population in it. It can't just be uninhabited wasteland. That population has to be governed by some kind of governing entity that claims and exercises authority over the territory and the population. And then finally, and this is an important point in the convention, the entity has to be capable of entering into relations with other states. And the convention goes on to say that you don't have to actually have relations with other states, nor do you have to be recognized by any other state to be considered a state. You just have to have the capacity to enter into relations with other states. If we apply those criteria to that central ISIS entity in Iraq and Syria, my argument would be it's a state. It meets those basic requirements. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should ever publicly acknowledge or legitimately uh, legitimize uh, its existence by recognizing it as a state. What I'm saying is that in thinking about the central entity of ISIS in Iraq and Syria, we're dealing with a state-like threat. And if you think about the threats that come from it, the existence of the Islamic State is tearing apart the traditional geopolitical structure of the Middle East and North Africa. It's generating a massive refugee flow into Europe, which is also destabilizing Europe. Uh, it's spreading uh, a degree of destabilization into Turkey, uh, into uh, Central Asia and South Asia, and of course into Southern Russia. And it's drawing regional powers, including Russia, but also including Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and others into a hot conventional war in the heart of the Middle East. It's not fundamentally a terrorism problem. It does have an element of terrorism to it, but this is an enemy, enemy with tanks and mortars and battalions that control cities, that organizes hospital systems, that has uh, supply lines, and is, is basically running a strategy of conventional military war of maneuver. And so that suggests that the response to that central level of the state, the strategic response, is one of conventional war. One that's led by the United States, but operates using a light footprint. And I'm going to talk about that more in a minute. But not with a very large number of US ground troops carrying the main combat burden, as we did for a long period of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, but rather with enablers, with a security force assistance framework, with certain key niche capabilities, assisting ground troops from other countries to carry the fight uh, to that conventional enemy threat. So that's the first layer of the um, very unappetizing layer cake of uh, Islamic State, if you like, right? The, the conventional threat, the caliphate that exists in, uh, in Iraq and Syria. The second layer is the wilayats, or the provinces, of the Islamic State. Um, at this point, 12 to 13, probably soon to be 14, as we expect a new wilayat to be declared in Southeast Asia very soon. Uh, I suspect the next one to, be, to emerge may actually be in Western Europe. We're looking at a series here of regional affiliates of the central uh, Islamic State, 
They think of themselves as provinces within a larger entity, but they operate in a different way from the central Islamic state. They're more like traditional guerrilla or terrorist organizations. None of them controls the country or a territory. Uh, none of them has the kinds of governmental structures that we see in the central state. They're not state-like entities in the same way that the central caliphate uh, is. But they do follow a lot of the same principles that are used by the central Islamic state. I like to think of the Wallachs as being kind of the TEDx of uh, Islamic State, right? You can set up your own alliance, but you've got to follow certain rules that are laid down by the central uh, parent entity. The threat then that comes from these wilayats is much more something that we've been very familiar with since 9-11. It's the threat of um, regional terrorism and guerrilla warfare. So they're undermining local and regional governments. They're undermining security and stability. They're having a very negative humanitarian effect that's generating a migration uh, and uh, a refugee problem across many regions of the planet. Uh, they've got an economic effect on our partners uh, and they are opening up opportunities for hostile nation states to take advantage of that circumstance if we don't. If that's the second layer and the threat is a classical insurgency and terrorism threat, the response then is foreign internal defense, security force assistance, uh, intelligence support and intelligence cooperation with the countries that are threatened, foreign assistance, diplomatic engagement, um, de-radicalization, and counter-radicalization. Again, things we're very familiar with for the last 15 years, but what's different is these are not standalone entities, nor are they parts of a bigger global insurgency, which is what our partner effectively was. Rather, they are extraterritorial entities within an entity that considers itself to be a state. And then the final layer is by far the largest numerically, and it's what I call the Internationale. And I'm consciously referring back about 100 years to uh, a much earlier period in world history. There's a lot of differences between the, the early emergence of the Bolsheviks and the Soviet Union in the 1920s and the Islamic State, but there are some strong uh, similarities which I'll talk about in a minute. We don't really know how many people are involved in this bottom layer of the structure. As one indicator, a couple of months ago, Twitter suspended 220,000 accounts which are considered to be directly linked to ISIS. Now, as we all know, 220,000 Twitter accounts isn't 220,000 people, right? It could be substantially fewer or more than that. Um, but we certainly see evidence of the existence of individuals, small groups, ad hoc organizations, uh, self-radicalized or remotely radicalized, acting on their own initiative but in concert with general guidelines laid down by the Caliphate and uh, perhaps supporting the Reliance. And we see that in about 79 countries globally. So it's a very widespread but very amorphous threat. This is a threat that I think is much closer to traditional domestic terrorism, subversion, um, and the sorts of things that we've seen with terrorism generally since the 1960s. <coughs> Individual and small group attacks, um, urban sieges, bombings, kidnappings, drive-by shootings, um, not full-on guerrilla warfare as we see with the Wallachians, and certainly not tanks and armored vehicles like we see with the central state, but a, a more classic domestic terrorism uh, entity. One of the other effects, if you like, a side effect of the existence of the, these groups is um, what are, some people call boomerang effects. The fact that domestic intelligence, surveillance, law enforcement, armed policing, political deliberalization are all required to deal with the threat. And so when we think about uh, that level of the, of the threat, one of the challenges is how do we defeat that threat without also destroying our societies in the process and turning them into police states? And the answer to that is you know, policing, domestic intelligence, border security, counter-radicalization. So what I've done is laid out three levels of the entity of the Islamic State. The obvious point is that if you're going to come up with a unified strategy here, you need to have a common vision of what it is that you're dealing with. And it is extraordinarily complex. It's easy to lay it out in a sort of three by four matrix as I've done here to describe it. When you actually try to execute on the ground, it becomes incredibly 
difficult. So what are the requirements? I think I would lay them out really quickly. One is we need a unified vision of the problem so that we can engage in a decentralised execution. And the better you are at coming up with a well thought through unified vision, the easier it is to execute at a decentralised level. We haven't done a great job on that. Secondly, we've got to make the light footprint work. There's a pattern in US uh, military history back to at least the middle of the 19th century where we get engaged in large scale, long duration, heavy combat type operations about once a generation for about a decade and then we go into a, a small footprint period where we don't do that. We try to do things with um, limited engagement, uh, more recently with air power, with special operations and intelligence work and we do that for about two decades until we forget how much it sucked the last time around and then we go back into a big uh, engagement. We are very much at the bottom of that sine wave now. So for the next 10 or 20 years, we're not going to be putting 200, 300,000 troops on the ground. We need to figure out how to do this with special mission aviation, with close air support, with drones, with special operators, with intelligence support, because those are the tools we're going to have uh, for the next decade or two. Thirdly, we've got to get out of our defensive crouch. We can't sit back and say there's all these threats out there and uh, they're all coming to get us and we've got to defend the homeland and maybe we'll get out of uh, our own territory if, if, uh, if pushed. Actually, we've got to figure out how to defeat the enemy at a distance because a defensive strategy against this kind of threat basically means locking the country down and turning it into a police state. And that would destroy what we're fighting for much more quickly than having let's say 10 or 20,000 troops deployed uh, overseas over a long period of time. And then finally, and this is really important, is we've got to avoid developing tunnel vision where all we worry about is ISIS. ISIS is not the only major terrorist threat. We also have um, Jabhat Fat al-Sham in Syria, which is an affiliate of Al-Qaeda. We've got a resurgent Taliban in Afghanistan. We've got a number of other jihadist terrorist groups. Then beyond the field of, of, of Islamic terrorism, we have a whole series of other non-state threats. And then, of course, as we previously talked about, we have the return of state-on-state -state conflict, Iran, Syria, North Korea, Russia, uh, and a variety of state-based threats. Your strategy cannot be effective if it only deals with one narrow pillar within that broader set of threats. <coughs> so I'm going to finish there, um, but I'll just finish with a quote from Ken Hubbard, the, uh, Depression era comic who once said that lots of folks confuse bad management with destiny. So I hear people talking about how it's not winnable, how it's mission impossible, how there's no way to do it. Uh, the fact that we are not winning doesn't mean it's unwinnable. It means we need to get our act together. And I think fundamentally it starts with having a viable strategic vision and most importantly having the will to win and deciding that we are actually going to defeat this threat. It doesn't really matter how good your strategy is or how effective your, your execution is, if at some societal or political leadership level, we don't really want to defeat the threat. And I think fundamentally that's the fount from which uh, an effective strategy grows. So I'm well ahead of time, but I'm gonna stop there because I know my co-panelists have a lot more interesting stuff to say to me, and we'll re-engage during Q&A, thanks. Dr. Kilcullen has laid out a couple key things in regards to strategic leadership. The first is accurately assessing the strategic environment and then adjusting your strategic vision for how to operate in that environment. Our next panelist is going to look at the problem from a little bit different angle and talk about strategic communications. And she will uh, address the problem uh, of ISIS and how we're competing in the war of ideas and communication. <laughs> Dr. Corey Gobber is a professor of communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she is also a research fellow at the Triangle Institute for Security Studies. She has been visiting research professor at the Strategic Studies Institute at the United States War College. Her research focus is the communication strategies 
of terrorist group with particular focus on their use of visual imagery. Her work has been published in journals such as Military Review, Small World Journal, and Rhetoric and Public Affairs. Please welcome Dr. Corey Dobbs. Okay, so I'm here to talk about the ways that ISIS slash the Islamic State has leveraged the disruptive effects of social media and how we might leverage social media to our advantage. So at UNC, we've been studying the materials that Al-Qaeda and now the Islamic State have been distributing via the web for a number of years. Um, the difference between our team and some of the others that have been working this problem is that we don't study their dis uh, distribution networks per se. We're actually looking at their content with an emphasis on the visual. So everyone has heard that their materials are a generation ahead of anything anyone else has done, anything anyone has ever seen. This is a video that's gotten a lot of attention. A lot of people have written about it. Um, you might say that it reflects the quality, the top quality they've achieved. So it's sort of peak ISIS, if you want to say that. Notice the camera angle gives you the sense that you're looking through your eyes. Right? It's your hands that are holding the bag. So it gives you the sense that you are walking through the market. Right? They even sway the camera to give you the sensation of walking. So the point here is to invite you to imagine yourself in the market. And if you think about it, what's the point of recruiting? It's to get you to imagine yourself in that space. So please imagine yourself coming to the Islamic State. You can be here walking through our fabulous market. And notice that there's no narration, right? The full freight here is being borne by the visuals. Now, by the time we get to the point where the fighters show up and they're treated like rock stars, and the other thing about the fighters is that their faces are mostly obscure which is very important because since you don't see the faces, it's much easier for you to imagine yourself there, right? So that's about as good as their stuff got. Then, late last year, we noticed this radical decentralization, right? Media production gets decentralized, pushed out to the really out that uh, Dr. Kilcullen mentioned. And when that happened, quality cratered. We thought, well, that's a pretty good thing. All of a sudden, they're producing much weaker uh, video material. But here's the thing. After a while, quality then starts at, at a, a very different pace for each one. But quality then starts to come back up. So here's an example of what we start to see as their quality begins to approach the top level it had been at. Now, this is a simple thing, but the sophistication is in the execution. Think about where the camera's placed here. It's in front of them. Right? Cameras in front, now the cameras in back, now the cameras in front. Now to do that, either you've got one guy who's doing a lot of walking in one day, or you've got multiple guys. And what makes that impressive is if you have two guys, it takes a lot of effort to figure out how to do that so that they don't show up in one another shot. Right? The guy in front doesn't want to be in the shot when the guy behind is filming and vice versa. That actually takes a good bit of effort to figure that out. Now, the question is, when they pushed out to the provinces, was there still centralized control? So they have all these provincial media distribution and production centers. Is someone in the center still controlling them? And the answer to that question is, I'm not really sure that it matters. So maybe it's the case that the product they're pushing out right now tends to look alike as it comes out of the provinces because there's tight centralized control. And that might be the case. Maybe it's the case that what's coming out of the provinces tends to look alike because everybody who worked, who went out to the provinces and started to train these new teams was trained by the same guy and so they all tend to work alike. And maybe the stuff that's coming out of the provinces tends to look alike because those guys who pushed out and started to form these new teams all worked together at the center, and so they have the same visual aesthetic. 
one way or the other, they're producing materials that tend to look alike. So whether it's because of central control or not, there's a similar visual aesthetic in play. Now, here's the thing, and this, I think, is important to state for this audience. It is incredibly important that young people specifically study these materials. I tell my students all the time that they are essentially my version of crowdsourcing, right? So let me ask, raise your hand if you're under 24. Oh, I shouldn't have asked that question. Um, so let me give you an example. There's a video that comes out right after the Paris attacks. And there's an anchor image in that, in that video. It's the most important image in the video. They repeat it a couple of times. Let me show you what that was. Okay, if you know where that source material is, just yell it out. G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe, Rise of the Cobra. The Islamic State is ripping from Marvel's superhero comics. Now, I give up a lot to do the work that I do. I do not think I should have to be to go see superhero movies. <laughs> okay? There's just there's a certain line that you should have to draw as far as the sacrifice you do for your work. So I will do this work if you guys go see the superhero movies and then tell me what images are being ripped. Here's the other thing, um, and again, this is something that Dr. Kilcullen mentioned. It's not just the Islamic State we have to worry about. So this is Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Wait for it. Wait for it. render my friends somebody who knew what they were doing spent two or three days working on this I mean that is high end and that's not the Islamic State wait wait okay now very recently Karak Arar al-Sham which I probably mispronounced put out a 15 minute video now, all of these groups have been using GoPros for a while, but they want you to see the GoPros, right? They put them right up front. So there's the GoPro footage, now the drone footage, and a lot of these groups use drone footage. Back to the GoPro, and I don't know if you can read the graphic, it says Abu Muhammad's camera. So they're telling you how they're editing it, which of the characters' footage you're looking at. Back to the drone, back to the GoPro, and they edit in after battle testimonial. This video is a reality show. Real world Al Sham. That's basically what they've done. It's unbelievable. And that's somebody else's, uh, uh, Surreer's camera or something. So, what have we been doing in response? You may know the Department of State had a program recently, mercifully, uh, put out of its misery. Um, let me show you a little bit of what State has been producing. I think those are unbelievably cheesy graphics. But that's not the real problem. I am a firm believer in the power of still imagery. There are multi-million dollar Super Bowl ads that only use stills, but they've got to be the right stills. As for instance, if you're going to make the argument, I don't know if you can read the subtitles, but if you're going to make the argument, as they do here, that mosques have been blown up, you need to show the mosques after they've been blown up, right? And the crazy thing is, in other videos, this exact same program actually showed mosques being blown up. So it's not like the material wasn't available to them, right? So now, back to where we were. 
If you're an English speaker, your eye is drawn automatically to the bottom third, because that's where the English subtitles are. But if you're an Arabic speaker, your eye is drawn to the bottom third, because it's the only color in the shot is the mic covers, right? So let me ask you, show of hands, how many of you saw the inset? Okay, about a third. So let's go back to the last 10 seconds. Look up in the corner. The suicide bombing Imam is discussing, they had footage of it, and they put it in the one space you were least likely to actually notice it. Five million dollar budget to produce that. We believe at Chapel Hill that only peer-to-peer, -peer, meaning materials conceived by, by people essentially the age of their target demographic, supervised by people who are, let's go with experience rather than older, um, is, is likely to work. So let me show you what my students did in three weeks. Let's bring the volume up a little bit. I miss you. I don't know how to talk about it with you. But you're scaring me. We used to play soccer every Saturday. No, I miss that. You were so excited for my sister's wedding, and then you didn't even show up. I've been thinking more and more about the time you took me fishing. You're so much happier than we don't even show up for class anymore. What happened? I miss you. What can I do? I would never call the cops on you, but I want to help. Our budget, zero. Uh, one student bought a plane ticket back home to Minneapolis-St. Paul, but she was going home anyway, so she filmed the street scenes there. Same class, different team. Both, I think, are one scrub away. There's, there's tweaks that still need to be done, but again, they only had three weeks. The end. Thank you very much. Dr. Dauber has given us a great presentation. Um, our next panelist has some ideas on strategy for this threat. Dr. Sebastian Gorka is a New York Times best-selling author. He's the chairman of the Threat Knowledge Group, where he provides training and expertise to the law enforcement, military, and intelligence community. In 2012, he was awarded the Joint Civilian Service Commendation by U.S. Special Operations Command. He has served as a reserve member of the British Army's Intelligence and Security Group, and he is now a United States citizen, hailing originally from the country of Hungary. His newest book, Defeating Jihad, The Winnable War, examines the jihadi movement and lays out a coherent strategy to defeat it. Please welcome Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Thank you very much, Colonel Gray, and thank you to the BMI and the superintendent for inviting me here today. It's a great pleasure to be back here on campus. When my family and I moved here eight years ago, uh, we almost ended up teaching here, thanks to the good graces of the Gottwald family but uh, NDU uh, jumped in there first, so I ended up teaching at Fort McNair. But it's great to be back. Um, I'm going to share with you today uh, my strategic assessment of the threat to the United States, and specifically with a focus on what I like to call the global jihadi movement. Uh, with, beyond that, I'm going to talk about what the conference is really about, which is leadership, and leadership when it comes to national security affairs. I am now the Vice President of a graduate school in DC, the Institute of World Politics, which is exclusively about national security. 
And one of the reasons I took that position is the paucity, the lack, the impoverished nature of strategy in America today. We live in a very strange situation where America is not only the greatest nation on God's earth, it is also the most powerful nation we have ever seen. At the same time, it is the most unstrategic nation in the world today. So why is that is the question I'd like us to arrive at. Before I do that, let's look at what you should expect when you get into national security, when you put on the cloth of the Republic, you're going to have to think about what the next war will look like. What are future conflicts going to challenge us with? When you ask the question, what is future war? A lot of people have these kinds of images come to mind. Very sexy platforms, stealth vehicles, armed UAVs. And of course, if we're big green, if we're, we're the army, how does Big Green think they're going to prosecute our future wars? Looking like Tony Stark. <laughs> right? They're going to put on their Iron Man Talos armor and vanquish our foes on the battlefields looking like Robocop. <laughs> what is the problem with this expectation? It's bogus. It's utterly bogus. It is a product of our strategic culture. Everybody has a strategic culture. The Chinese, the North Koreans, Russia, ISIS, so do we. And ours, since at least the Vietnam War, has been an absolute, uh, unmitigated, uh, infantilized um, passion for technology. We're going to solve everything with the next widget, with the next algorithm. <coughs> The next sexy toy. Because we love our technology. How many personal electronic devices do you own? Probably more than Secretary Clinton, right? <laughs> you said you could only hack one, right? You've got your iPhone, your iWatch, your Android, your laptop, smart computer, your smart TV. We love our technology. But, as David said, the greatest contribution to strategy that the Prussian general gave us wasn't his axiom that war is the continuation of politics. Far more important was his admonition that you must, as a commander, understand first the nature of the conflict you are about to engage in and not twist it into something else you would like to fight. These are the kinds of wars we would like to fight because it gives us a natural advantage. But just look at the last 15 years. Look at the first three years of OEF, OIF. What were the two deadliest weapon platforms used against our warfighters? IEDs, an artillery shell with two wires coming out of it. Not exactly high tech. And until we got our MRAPs and everything was up armored, the other platform was what? The RPG. 70-year-old technology that doesn't even have one integrated circuit in it, let alone a microchip. Rule one of war, the enemy gets a vote. You don't always get to choose the nature of the war you have to fight. So what should we all expect? What do you have to prepare for? You have to prepare for the reality of the current threat environment. I've just chosen some photographs from around the world in the last couple of years. A jihadi attack in Saudi Arabia, an attack in Europe, a fighter pilot burnt alive by ISIS, an attack in the diplomatic quarter of Bangladesh, Dhaka. This man has just beheaded a British serviceman on the streets of the United Kingdom. Not Mogadishu, on the streets of the UK outside an army base. And then stood there afterwards giving interviews to people on their iPhones. What about this? Let's bring it all back home. A photograph we don't see. They won't show it to you because we censor ourselves after 9-11. These are the survivors of the Pulse nightclub massacre. 49 Americans killed in the name of ISIS in one evening. Or Europe, an American rock concert. People executed. But we now know, after the French tried to keep it secret in the last six months, 
What happened to those individuals before they were killed? They were tortured. The men were castrated. The women were tortured before they were killed. And just when we thought ISIS couldn't get any more perverse, what do we have in this video? They can't even be bothered to manually decapitate us anymore. So what do they use instead? They found a new purpose for detonating cord. They take their hostages, wrap debt cord around their necks, and then they decapitate them at 3,000 feet per second. And then lastly, bring it all back home again. Who is that? Another photograph you won't see on the cover of USA Today. That is Mr. Farouk from Farouk and Malik. The San Bernardino killers. I do a lot of work with our law enforcement officers. And I always ask them, what is the image you remember from San Bernardino when you finally got them? We self-censored ourselves. So what did the newspapers put on the front pages? Just the photograph of the big black SUV, remember? That they hired for the operation, but riddled with 300 bullet holes. Yes, do you remember that photograph? I always like to point out to those law enforcement officials. Two tangos and 300 rounds? And you're still cuffing? You can never be too short, can you? <laughs> protocol is protocol. You, you've got to lighten it down again. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, let's get back. Let's get back. This is the reality of the threat environment. It's getting worse, not better. And what you have to prepare for is the empirical reality. And let me give it to you in the form of this visual. Five years ago, David and I wrote an article for the chairman of Joint Chiefs magazine, Joint Forces Quarterly. It was a critique of FM 324, the so-called Petraeus Counterinsurgency Manual. You can download the article online. That's not why this uh, slide is here. I want to share with you this one diagram that we put at the beginning of the article that has got a lot of traction since then, especially in the special operations community. There is at the University of Pennsylvania a superb unclassified database that I recommend to you. It's called the Correlates of War Project. The correlates the Correlates of War Project. And it is a database of every war since Napoleon, since 1850. When the war started, who was involved, how many casualties have it in there? And we just jumped into that database to prove a point by providing a taxonomy of that history of warfare. And we found the following. According to the database, in the last 200 years, there have been 460 wars. 460. So that is your end set. That is your data pool. 460. If you separate them into what we call conventional warfare and unconventional, we find something really shocking. Of the 460 wars since Napoleon, less than 20% are conventional, meaning a government sends its military to fight the military of another government or governments, like World War I, World War II. Of the 460, more than 80%, 380, fall into the category of what we call doctrinally irregular or unconventional warfare. The largest category of war in the last 200 years is when a government uses its military to fight a non-state actor. Whether it's the Marines in one of their first international missions 200 years ago against the Barbary pirates off the shores of Tripoli. Interesting to know who are the Barbary pirates? Jihadis. We've been fighting Jihadis for 200 years, not 50. Whether it's the Barbary pirates 200 years ago, or whether it's our JSOC elements fighting the Islamic State today in Syria and Iraq, that is warfare, with a small subset of conflicts where no nation-state actors are involved, such as tribal warfare. So what does this mean for you that are considering going into military service as part of our federal armed forces? It means one thing. War is most often untimely. It's not about divisional assets moving across a plane. It's not about battle carrier groups engaging each other in the South China Sea. 
It's about hunting men down in the mountains of South Asia or North Africa. And that is what we have to prepare for, and we have to rethink warfare. <coughs> so, uh, I'd like to share with you our study on the Islamic State. Uh, we did a two-year project for the last commanding general at Fort Bragg, uh, Lieutenant General Cleveland. And one of the products that came out of that work was this in-depth analysis of ISIS, and why ISIS is much more dangerous than Al-Qaeda ever was. Um, before he handed over command, General Cleveland said, this is free for anybody to access, it is unclassified. If anybody in this room wants to read this report, we have uh, distribution sheets that we'll hand out now. And if you give us a low side email, we will have this PDF sent to you, and you can digest it, and you can share it with others. So the sheets are coming around right now. But let me give you the bottom line up front, very briefly, what our conclusions were of our analysis. ISIS is not the JV team. On the contrary, they are the cops. Okay? <laughs> I, I don't know nothing about American sports, but I guess the cops are a big deal today, right? Okay. So, um, they're not a JV team on four very simple metrics. Number one, they are a trans regional insurgency, not just a terrorist group like Al Qaeda. They didn't borrow somebody else's insurgent group like Al Qaeda did in Somalia with Al Shabaab or they did in Afghanistan with the Taliban. ISIS recruited its own fighter base, 86,000 jihadis in just a couple of years. That's impressive. Not only that, they captured and held territory in multiple countries of multiple regions. This isn't just Iraq and Syria, this is Libya, this is Mali, this is Nigeria. Boko Haram is a fully paid up member of ISIS. They changed their name to the West African province of the Islamic State. We have never seen an insurgency that operates and has affiliates according to the National Counterterrorism Center in 18 nations around the world. That's not sympathizers, that's fully operational affiliates. That is unique in the history of insurgency. Second, it is the richest threat group of its kind in history. I'm not talking about nation-state actors. I'm not talking about the Soviet Union or the Third Reich. I'm talking about non-nation-state actors. ISIS, according to the USG unclassified estimates, makes between two and four million dollars every 24 hours. Why is that scary? Because 9-11 only cost Al-Qaeda $500,000. And that did one trillion dollars worth of damage to our nation. ISIS makes $500,000 in six hours. Not a JV. Third, its capacity to mobilize is stunning. In just a few years, more than 85,000 trigger pullers, 36,000 of whom are not even Iraqis or Syrians. Incredible. They're people from outside the war zone. And scariest of all, for us living here, at least 6,000 of them are Westerners. Americans, Brits, Germans, people on the visa waiver program that have freedom of movement. And when they learn how to build an IED, how to handle an AK and CQB, if they come back home, the question is, are they going to go back to the stocking the shelves of Walmart? Probably not. The most important thing of all is what happened in Mosul in June of 2014. This is what means, this is what indicates ISIS is going to the Super Bowl. Two and a half years ago, from the pulpit of the Grand Mosque in, in Mecca, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi declared the re-establishment of the Caliphate. But why is it a big deal? Because it wasn't empty words. It's everything you've heard about. Territory, population, the capacity to tax its own people, to monopolize power. Why is it a big deal? Because since the Caliphate was dissolved in 1924 by Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, when he created the Tur modern Turkish state. For 90 years, the jihadis have been trying to bring the caliphate back, and they all failed. The Muslim Brotherhood failed, Al-Qaeda failed, but this organization, they didn't talk about it, they just did it. They're back. That is why they are so deadly. To conclude, most important question in all education, whether you are studying to be a brain surgeon or a general officer, is the so what question. What does this all mean? 
This, these are just my, as, as David said at the beginning of his presentation, this is where I want to provoke you. I'm just going to throw some you know, academic hand grenades out there, and we'll see if they have any effect in the Q&A. Number one. America hasn't thought or acted strategically since November 9, 1989. Since the Berlin Wall was taken down, we have acted like a brainless giant. We need to get back to basics. Even in Gulf War, we did not achieve what we should have, should have achieved, and as a result, had to go back to Iraq. Unfortunately, I know VMI is an exception. I spent six and a half years in the Federal Joint Professional Military Education System, and I contend we at our war colleges do not teach strategy. We teach the history of strategy. You can take 300 courses on the Peloponnesian Wars that will not teach you how to be a strategy, how to be a strategist. We teach the history, not the how of strategy. We need to return to basics. Strategy is very simple. Hard to do, but simple. Why? It's about what are our real interests. It's not about saving the whales or stopping the ice caps melting. It's about the security of our nation, physically and politically. What are our real interests? Why do we care? Who or what is the real threat, and how I, are they attacking us, and what can we do about it? You answer those questions without diverting yourself into groupthink, and we will do better. And lastly, we must understand war is much, much more than just bullets and bombs. It's everything you heard from Professor Dow. We are being crushed in the war of the soul, the war of the mind. Uh, as you heard earlier, um, if you want my plan, my plan to defeat this enemy is in my book, Defeating Jihad. It's a very simple three-stage plan. It's built upon NSC 68, the top secret plan used during the Cold War, written by Paul Nietzsche on how to defeat the Soviet Union. It was declassified in the 1970s. We have a template. We've done it before, and we can do it again. But, just to open the aperture, this isn't just about ISIS. This month, I have an article in the Military Review and it's about how everybody is using irregular warfare against us. It's ISIS, it's China, it's the Russians. We need to understand they are at war with us now, all of them. And we have to fight them on the irregular plane. If you uh, have any questions or would like to ask offline, those are my contact details. Best way to reach me is my Gmail. I'm very active on social media. My wife says too active. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Seb Gorka. Everything I do for public consumption is on my personal website, thegorkabriefing.com, all my media, everything else. If I haven't adequately depressed you uh, already, there's a 10-part ISIS video lecture that you can download. Anybody interested in grad school when it comes to national security, please check out our website, the Institute of World Politics. And then uh, lastly, everything we do for the warfighter, for the IC, is at our commercial site. We have four ISIS reports. Check them out. That's threatknowledge.org. Thank you for inviting me. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we now have some time for some questions from our panelists. And the rules of engagement are, if you have a question, I'd like you to stand up, say who you are, what institution you're from, and direct your question either to a single panelist or to the whole panel. Please identify that in part of your question. But I want to start off with a couple questions myself to start the conversation among the panelists. So many, and including uh, many of our panelists up here, have criticized our country for a perceived lack of strategy to deal with the global part of this jihadism that they talked about. What strategic vision, principles, and methods should actually underwrite U.S. strategy? So we've talked broadly. You framed out the, the strategic environment for us. You talked a little bit about communication and vision. So how do we take that now to some guiding principles? 
And Dave, do you want to start out and we'll go down the line? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think if you would put the, this, I mean, it's easy to, to state the strategic objective, right? It's much harder to execute. Um, I think it's actually going a little too far to say that we haven't had a strategy, right? There's a people at Complan 7500, old now, at the uncut level, it's, it's some of it's been, been published, talks about what the, the strategy of the war on terrorism really since 2004, 2005 has been, and that is to isolate the threat, defeat the isolated threat, and then prevent it from re-emerging. Um, if you were to try to come up with a similar catechism for now, I would say we need to defeat the state-based threat in Iraq and Syria. We need to provide effective assistance to our partners in dealing with the riots. And we have to defend the homeland without destroying society and progress. And I think you then get into very specific tasks under that. But that's the essence of three things we need to do here uh, to address each of those three layers and the threat that we have. Other comments? Look, I'm not a strategist, but I do pictures. Um, but I think in, in my arena, it is ridiculous that we are 15 years after 9-11 and have not gotten our act together in terms of how to respond to the arguments that are being made by this particular entity. Um, they have finally, the government has finally figured out that they are not competent, it seems to me, and they are starting to outsource in a way. Right, so you see funding for peer-to-peer, -peer, funding for community partnerships, etc. And I think that's a positive step. Um, the, the issue it is a mistake that I still see repeated that people are constantly looking for the master narrative. Right? You've got to find the master narrative. What's the master narrative? Well, if you study whether Islamic State or Al Qaeda or any other group. They don't have a master narrative. The reason why their rhetoric succeeds is that they have multiple buckets of narratives because they understand that they are recruiting multiple demographics. So every time, <coughs> excuse me, every time we look for a master narrative, we fall short because we're not trying to counter recruit a single demographic. And that's part of the reason why the government's efforts have been weak, I think. So, so long as they continue to try and put funding out to people who may be able to kind of recruit within their graphics that they understand, that will work much better. I just think the government is not ever going to be able to, to crack this particular edge. I'd like to tie both of these concepts together and, and go back to November 9th, 1989. I know for most of this room that's ancient history that we're talking about Sparta. Uh, but November 1989, 1989, we won the Cold War. Now, how many missiles were fired across Checkpoint Charlie on that night? How many M16s were utilized? Zero. But we won. How did we therefore win? Remember, we didn't take down the Berlin Wall. Who took it down? The people on the other side living inside the communist bloc. So what have we succeeded in doing? We haven't just financially bankrupted the Soviet Union. We have ethically and morally bankrupted its ideology. We showed communism to be the decrepit, hollow, false promise that it is. Well, guess what? We are fighting totalitarians again. This time it is jihadists. So how do we win? We can kill them all. I mean, our guys at JSOF, they can stack them like cordwood. Really, I mean, they're amazing. And I, I've told them as well, I've told the SEALs. I've said, guys, it's really cool. We can get you know, GPS coordinates of an HVT, and we can track them down. And if we have set death code to sign off, we can kill them in 72 hours. It doesn't matter where you run, we will get you. So what? You kill Abu Bakr, who cares? You kill a jihadi. If the next day 20 jihadis volunteered to replace them, what have you created? The deadly cycle. The last 15 years, if we want to be charitable, there's been what I like to call exquisite whack-a-mole. Right? And we're very good at that. We win when we bankrupt the ideology of jihad. 
right now, from the streets of Raqqa to Paris, jihad is too sexy. We have to make it as unsexy as the KKK, as the Third Reich, as any totalitarian ideology. And we have to admit that the best people to do that isn't us. It's not you know, white-skinned or brown-skinned Americans, it's who? It's our Muslim allies in the region, the Jordanians, the Egyptians. We have to help them make the kinds of videos your students made in three weeks, right? Three weeks? Then we can start the witness period. It's the defectors, right? Mm -hmm. There's this pool of defectors trapped in Turkey because they can't go home again, and nobody's put them on the road. Very few people are putting them on camera. We had access to those videos. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll just say, I noticed that Professor Mavadan and the first session I understood here um, was asked the question, you, what do you do about Syria? And he, 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 he didn't have time to, to answer that in detail. Right now, we have somewhere between 1 million and 4 million refugees, many of whom are of military age, located in Western Europe. That's the force with which we recontact and stabilize Syria, right, and Iraq. Uh, and to think that we don't have those resources, we have actually huge resources, we're just not using them, we're treating them as a problem instead of a resource. So I want to I tie together your, your comments here because it comes back to this notion and what the panel has asked you to do is, so do our allies, whether we're talking about the Europeans, the Australians, or our Arab allies, do they share the same perception of the threat? And if not, how do we persuade them to, to develop this common strategic vision to counter this threat? There's no unique attitude, uh, but we have to start with the people who are on the front line. Remember, the, the, the primary victim of jihadi groups is not Christians or Yazidis or Jews. I mean, they decimate those, but who's the primary target? It's Muslims who disagree with them. So if you go to Egypt, yes, they get it. You talk with President Sisi, he understands it. You can talk to King Abdullah of Jordan, the Emiratis, they get it. So we have to bring those people together who have a five meter target in their backyard. But the, the real challenge of doing that is the last 15 years. I work very closely with our Sunni allies. I trained most of the GOs in, in Jordan, in Jordan, armed forces and elsewhere. What do they think about America after the last 15 years? Think we're unreliable. We go into the China shop and what do we do? We don't just bust stuff up, we let off a few claymores, right? And then we leave. And we say, oh, it's your problem, we've won. That is not good. Our most important allies see us as unreliable. So whoever wins the next election really has to rebuild those bridges with the people who are on the front line and should be the front line. <coughs> Um, to agree with that, but just to, to be a bit more specific about Iraq and Syria, um, if we want to get our regional allies on the board, as Seb's talking about, we need to come up with an answer to the form of Assad. Um, if you are a Syrian citizen, the regime is much more dangerous to you than the Islamic State. At this point, Bashar al-Assad and, and the Syrian government have killed roughly nine and a half times as many people as the Islamic State inside Syria. And most of the people that are fighting alongside us uh, in Syria are doing so they, because they joined the revolution to overthrow the state. And whenever ISIS stands up next to them and says, we too are going to stand with you and um, we have more military capability than anybody else uh, and uh, you, know, you can take what we are, our ideology, but you know, we'll help you to, to overthrow ISIS. That has a hugely powerful pull on locals in Syria. It also makes it very hard for people like the Turks, the Israelis, the Jordanians, and others to get aligned with us uh, when they see the Iranians uh, and Assad as at least as serious a threat to the region as, um, as ISIS. So I think that's a fundamental problem we need to be dealing with very early in the new administration if we hope to get uh, a concert of powers approach going in the region. Right. We have time for a couple questions from the audience. Please stand up. Lieutenant Asbury, United States Air Force Academy. Uh, my question is for the panel at large. Um, so what other roles besides simple security do you see the military playing long-term counterinsurgency and subsequent nation rebuilding efforts? And then related to that, like it or not, we do have considerable technology at our disposal. How can we leverage that without wasting the taxpayer dollars to a medicine that effort? 
Uh, they nailed it, uh, for those who are not familiar with the jargon yet. It's not coin, it's fit. So counterinsurgency is what imperial powers do on their colonial territories. It's what France does in the northern département of North Africa. It's what the Brits do in Northern Ireland or against the Mau Mau. Uh, we're not an imperial nation. I don't care what Chomsky says, okay? We were born in a rejection of imperialism. And as a result, Americans don't like it when we act like an imperial power. We should be doing more fit what, what the Green Berets were originally created to do. Be guerrillas or help other nations fight their insurgents. We should be in the background, training, advising. When it comes to technology, ISR, uh, the stuff that our allies can't have access to. But remember, at the end of the day, the one thing Clausewitz again has to be uh, thanked for is he emphasized what? War is about humans. At the end of the day, his analogy was what? Two men playing cards, two men wrestling each other. It's the human will. Technology only gets you so far. So emphasize the human aspect of warfare and, and get to a point where, where we understand that it's not going to be a panacea to develop new technology. Next question. Gentlemen down here. My name is Braden Trent. I'm from the uh, East Tennessee State University Rome Scholars Program. My question is for the entire panel. Uh, why has the United States uh, not pursued overwhelming superiority in the last 15 years in terms of propaganda? What steps can be taken domestically and internationally <coughs> to instill Western values in young people to prevent further recruitment to terrorist organizations? So um, that is an interesting question. There are specific specialties in the military. So public affairs, what we used to call psychological operations, etc. From 9-11 forward, we continued to say that this was in many ways a war of ideology, that this was an information war, etc. And yet, those military specialties were consistently under-resourced, they weren't given enough people, they weren't, in many cases, they were, um, I don't know if hot was the word, but they were trading off on computers. They were sharing computer space in some, in some conflict zones. It's crazy how little uh, support that they have been given to do the job that would have supported what we were saying these wars actually were. Why? I have no clue. It makes no sense to me. It's never made any sense to me. Part of it was that we kept saying that it was the State Department that had lead for this kind of uh, job. I think you know what I think of the job the State Department had been doing all along, okay? So for 15 years we've been falling, falling further and further behind because the military, who has the confidence to do this kind of work, has been under-resourced because the State Department was supposed to be taking the lead while the State Department has been with us. So that's part of what's been happening. Meanwhile, um, I believe that we have not, it, it's just been too scattershot, too, uh, I think part of it is just the word propaganda. Americans associate the word propaganda, frankly, with Nazism, right? With, with what happened in World War II. And when you say, hey, we've got to get better propaganda, uh, what Americans hear is we have to behave like girls. And so automatically there is a, a bad taste in people's mouth. I think part, that's part of what's going on as well. I think if we didn't use the word propaganda, but instead said the Islamic State is recruiting people away from their families, who's really the first victim every time someone is recruited to go fight in Syria for the Islamic State? It's really the Muslim family. They lose the child first, right? So I think if we reframed what the effort was, and frankly, DHS is now sort of taking lead on this, and they're talking about it in terms of counter-extremism, which isn't a term that I like, but it seems to be working. And if you say counter-extremism encompasses not only counter-jihad, but also you know, counter-skinheads, and so we're, we're getting counter-white supremacists and we'll get everybody resources and we'll make it all a program, that seems to be something more powerful to people 
so maybe that will finally be what breaks the dam in terms of resource support and so forth. I hope. Uh, amazing question. Uh, there is an answer for, for why we are so bad at it. Um, and it's the ideological decision taken by this administration that ideology has no role to play in this war. This administration wants you to believe, again and again and again, that our enemy has nothing to do with religion. Right? It's, you know, these are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> okay? It's all about what? It's a very, very Marxist interpretation. It's about material things. Uh, remember, the deputy press spokesman of the State Department on national television said America will be safe and there will be no more 9-11s if we have jobs for jihadis. Now that's a bad SNL skit, okay? Because <laughs> most of these guys aren't there just for money. They really think they're fighting for the new Canaan. But if we say, no, 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 nothing to do with religion, then you don't get to the core of the issue, that they are being recruited because they believe I'm a warrior for God. Now don't get me wrong, we're not at war with Islam. Again, we're the majority of the victims, Muslims. But if you deny how they are recruiting people, then how are you going to stop them recruiting? You're not going to effectively do anything that is efficacious on the long term. So political correctness is, is the answer. It really is uh, the, the misdiagnosis of the disease. Okay, you get the last one. When I first served in Afghanistan, there was a guy called Mullah Dadullah Lange who worked with another guy called Bahadur Zakir. And they came up with something that I thought was incredibly instructive when you compare it to the way we do information operations. I think it's Appendix H or Appendix I of the op order is the information warfare appendix, right, which just shows you that it is literally an afterthought, right? We come up with a scheme maneuver first, and then 24 hours before the operation, we throw it over the transfer to the guys in the information ops world and say, hey, figure out how to sell this, right? Or worse, we let the gunners get into it, and they start talking about how they're going to treat the target with a certain number of messages per hour, uh, and it all gets into this kind of black art of fire plan, right? What one of the door said was, guys, this is the information operations objective. This is the message we're trying to send. Now, go away and plan physical operations to support that objective, right? So in their framing, the operations order is the information operation. The rest of it is just the physical stuff to carry out to send that message. We had to shoot that guy in the head to stop them from doing that process, right? Because it was so effective that it was dramatically undermining what we're trying to do in Iraq. Um, uh, in Afghanistan. Final point is, I, I want to just speak briefly in favour of killing people. Okay? There is a there is a myth out there that counterinsurgency is peacekeeping. That it's all about being nice to people. That if we win people over, win hearts and minds, that that will end the problem. Counterinsurgency is not peacekeeping. Counterinsurgency is a form of warfare. If you are not killing a substantial number of people, you are probably doing it wrong. You just have to but you have to be killing the right people in the right way to send the right message to the right population in order to achieve the outcome you're looking for. So it's random killing or non-strategic killing or killing that, that undermines your objective. That's the problem. If you can find the right guy on day one of the campaign, put him in a coffin, you have a much simpler information operations problem going forward. So, you know, Let's not think that it's not about killing. That's the sort of flip side of the, of the whack mole problem. This thinking, as said, has been suggesting, I think that we can do this without actually fighting. Oh, not at all. But Sorry, I'm not saying you're suggesting that. Right. I'm saying you're saying people are saying. Yeah, I, I think I think uh, the French got it down, and then Zawa here they actually quoted. He said this kind of war, about 30 percent of it's committed. About 30 percent. You kill the right people. <laughs> the rest of it, it's our pit to make people not want to join. Everybody remembers the awakening in the search. They forget that the Marines and the Army killed hundreds of people in the six to four months before that to make that possible. If we hadn't done that right, it wouldn't have worked. If you could just manage to shoot down the drones that are filming everything, that would be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're at the end of our panel. Please give them a round of applause.